Okay, so yeah, what we want to look at here is the idea that um, when we're building large scale systems, um, we need probably a lot more than we usually have in terms of how we handle architecture and code. So a lot of these ideas came from uh, myself and colleagues when we were working on that thing. And we were jealous of our, our uh, other engineers who had all kinds of interesting tools and ways of handling the abstractions that they needed. Mind you, their disciplines were hundreds of years old. So OK, they're a little ahead of us. But it was very frustrating to try to build large scale systems without any help, like without visual help, without specifications that you can actually work with on the factory floor, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we want to talk about here. So there's a bunch of ideas in here to kind of throw it out and see what you, you, know, you people think. Any comments? Uh, this isn't a lecture by any means, I hope. So just bring up any ideas or, or questions or thoughts you have. And um, we can explore this together. So with that. Let's proceed. So what we work with as a raw material in code is text, right? So it's pretty hard to manage text and text and megabytes of text as an architect, right? So even if you're trying to build a system like this, there's a point where you've lost control of it in terms of knowing what every line of code is doing or knowing what the overall structure is, knowing how it's, how it's meta properties or it's emergent properties are coming out of, you know, where are the tipping points? Where are your hot spots? That sort of stuff is not something you're going to see when you look at this, right? So that's a problem. We have a bunch of ways of trying to work with that. Um, we draw these sorts of pictures. We have state machines. We have, you know, Schler Miller from the past. All these kinds of different ways of trying to specify and abstract from that you know, pile of detail upwards a little bit, hopefully to a point where a human being can see the overall relationships and the entities and work with them at some level. Um, the problem with these pictures is that um, they're not real, right, in a sense. They're, they're basically, um, it's, you know, there's whiteboard architects, if you will, right? So this is a, a thing that doesn't have any mapping to the actual code or vice versa, right? So this is a problem because it's, it's as an architect or a designer even, or even a developer's job, your job is to make sure that your system is, is properly structured, uh, is built in a way that it's manageable. If you can't actually see it without looking at the code directly to do that, it's going to be very difficult to make sure that it's properly built, right? So. So that's sort of the motivation for this, is what can, we do, what can we do better here to bridge this gap? So, okay, what have we got? So we know that we have this issue, but we know that we're going to have code. I mean, the one thing that we're never not going to have in software development is some form of code, right? I think we can all agree on that. Um, the other thing that then we'll have is packages, so some form of code structure. Um, if you're using other languages other than Java, you've got files and folders, but namespaces come in. You've got some kind of way of managing this, this pile, again, of text into something that makes sense in terms of uh, containment. And then finally, if you're working in an IDE, and we'll be talking about IDEs here, project and modules is another layer. Now, it's not a, um, although thankfully in Java 9, it will be part of Java, um, whenever we all start using that. But the... Um, the idea of the uh, project or module in Eclipse or IntelliJ is that you have another layer, which is you can structure modules, right? So I'll talk a bit about that too. So those are helpful, but there's still, in any large project, a mass of information that's very difficult to visualize and to get a grip on. And as time goes by, even if you start out with a really nice layout, um, time moves on and things happen in the system that you may not be aware of. Uh, as a team lead or a developer. The other thing that we found is that people are having a lot of, hard, uh, a lot of uh, difficulty with legacy systems and with uh, working on a new system. So if you, if you come on to a project and the first thing that um, your manager tells you is, well, here's the IDE and there's Git and go enjoy yourself. So it's very difficult to learn what the structure of that system is just by reading the code. I mean, you can look at the packaging that's going to help. 
but there's got to be a better way of doing this. And also, we want to be able to work with this stuff going forward, right? So the goal here is we want to be able to form a mapping between real, quote unquote real, so the code, and new architecture. So even if we want to specify new architecture, how do we go about doing that? Now, one of the advantages that we have as, as software engineers and designers that the people doing you know, structural steel and things don't have is that we can actually fairly easily check our work because all of our work is right in front of us. You don't have to climb 20 stories up to look at a weld. You can just do it right at your desk. So in a sense also, there's no excuse for any of this. <laughs> Okay, so let's start with uh, some sort of real pictures and we'll work, we'll basically work upwards here. And what I'll try to do is get to a point where we can see that there's a way of bridging this gap. And then I want to work through some examples of what, uh, what that really feels like when you're inside an IDE and, and what other ways do we have to specify architecture, real honest to God, you know, structure and put it onto a system and have it be maintained, right? That is our objective. So here we have um, a class, right? Um, even this class, it's not particularly large, but it's pretty complicated. But you know, this is our sort of leaf area in Java, right? So we've got a class with a number of things in it, all different kinds of things. Um, but that's good. So there's a there's an atom, if you will, of our of our world, right? So if we move along from that, okay, we, let's organize the classes into some sort of structure. Now what you'll see here is that we're using basically trees and directed graphs, right? Which is sort of natural. I mean, if anybody has any other ideas, there's, I'll, I'll talk about some, some of the way other people have gone about doing this. But for us, it was directed graphs were primarily the, the method for understanding this. So here we have a, a set of classes. There's some kind of organization and there's a layering. And now we're talking about one level up from the methods, fields, and, and types and stuff, right? So that's good. Okay, that's interesting. And then boom. Okay, now we go into packages and everything and it's like everything's talking to everybody and it's wild, right? So, I mean, we've all seen these kinds of things in our code, with, you know, enough said. It, it's, it basically, it's the kind of a loss of comprehension at a certain point, right? And we need tools for this, we really do, right? So, it, inside of that um, heap there of those uh, items talking to each other, we do have things like, um, you know, projects in IDEs. You know, we have folders and jars. We have packaging, nesting packaging structures. We have, um, you know, some help with this, right? But one thing this does not give us when we're working in this day to day is the uh, dependencies, right? And that the dependencies are this. That's what is the killer in these pictures is all of these dependencies. Right? So how do we work with that? That's got to be a key part of this whole structure is building in not only this picture at a certain level, but pu putting the dependencies in and working at a project level. Right? So that's what I'd like to talk about is how, how can we get these kinds of pictures in our world closely enough that, um, that they are pragmatic and useful day to day and do help us understand and, and promote architecture. Again, so here is a, another way of looking at this tree structure in terms of an overall uh, layering scheme, right? So this gives us a bit better picture. But again, without the dependencies here, it's a bit, it's a bit um, misleading in that this could be a very nice architecture. But if these guys are all talking to each other, we have to be able to see that, right? So it looks completely different when you overlay the dependencies on it, right? You might look at that and go, okay, that's all right. But you see a few hot spots, and what you'll find is if you put if you put your projects through um, tools such as the one that that our place builds, you can be surprised sometimes at the way that the dependencies have come out over the years. Um, now, truthfully, if you're working on a small system with only a few packages or something, this doesn't really become a a, a major problem. But once you get into a certain scale of system, the level of dependency interaction becomes almost your limiting factor for quality, right? Okay, so let me keep moving here. 
Right. So just the point is, you know, this is this is a normal thing for a lot of open source projects. We analyze them. We see this all the time. There's uh, dependencies going back and forth across that tree everywhere. Right. Okay. So we want to be able to build something that helps us with this. So what are the kind of little requirements for this for, from a bullet point point of view? We want to be able to have this as a map for developers. So whatever we're doing here has to be real in the sense that it's going to be able to be used by developers. I think if we're doing something that can't be used by developers, that's a huge shortcoming in whatever you know, process or method we have. Um, we want to be able to use it to do phase development. So in other words, I want to be able to specify ahead of where I am, but I also, we, I also we want to uh, be able to look at projects that exist now and understand them. So this helps you divide the work up. Obviously, if you're doing things like, um, I'll do an example later, but if you're working on a system that is that interconnected, it's very difficult to have teams work independently. Um, it, and I mean, you might be getting the message, there's nothing really complicated about this. It's mostly about coupling cohesion and containment, right? Um, but the problem is without any tools or help at, that, at this level, it becomes sort of de facto that, oh, it's okay if it's really noisy. So the big, the big here, thing here around containment is modularity. So we have to be able to support that. We want to be able to, once you have modularity, we want to be able to reuse and replace subsystems. So the word subsystem even, you know, do you have subsystems really? You know, very important concepts when you're working with large systems. Um, one other thing about this which we found really useful is that once you have these sort of visualizations, you can do very quick uh, assessments of certain kinds of changes. Um, we all probably have heard the stories and maybe been involved with them about uh, people who made a small change to a little module ended up bringing down the system or costing a, you know, a company a million bucks or something. And it was probably because they thought it was a small change in a, in a place. They did some testing, but they didn't realize that actually this little piece of uh, algorithm was being used by the rest of the world, right? So uh, I thought, you know, Joe was using it, so I talked to Joe and he tested it and it was fine. But, you know, our outsource team was using it for something completely different and it blew up. So we need to be able to see that, right? This is the point. We want to be able to see that stuff quickly and easily. All right. Okay. So start. Basically, I'm going to go through now like uh, a little bit of a procedure for this and then we can work through some examples. Um, so where would we start? Well, start visualizing the structure you're visualizing the structure you have now. So if you're working on any realistic system, you've probably got a whole lot of code already in place or in production. Um, and one thing you might want to do is just have a look at it, right? And so we'll, we'll look at some examples of that. That will give you an idea that am I in a position here to work with uh, modules, putting modules in place? Or do I have an even more fundamental situation where I just want to get a grip on some hot spots and some, some places I know there are issues? And maybe I want to divide and conquer those, right? So the key is to get a grip on where you are at the moment. So that's the first thing we'll look at. The next thing then, once you've got a, an idea of what you've, what you've got on hand at, at this sort of upper level, is to start at the top, usually, and lock in and shore up the de facto architecture that exists. Right? So de by de facto there, we kind of mean what you know, status quo. What is there now in terms of your top level modules? If they don't look so bad in terms of how they're using each other, um, there is some layering, there is a structure, the team understands it, those kinds of things. Then you can take that and publish that as an architecture and, and move on, right? And you can start by looking at things like, you know, parts of these modules have perhaps too many things in them. Parts of them are doing um, more than one job and have third party things that are locked in there in a way we don't want. Um, perhaps we need to next year move to uh, a different OS and we've got OS like, you know, links all in the middle layer even of the system. So whatever, it ha whatever your architecture needs are, take the top level and at least lock in the top level and divide out those uh, separation of concerns, right? That kind of thing. And then third is the holy grail, which is to, you know, get to this point where you're fully in charge and you can continue to improve and extend the architecture. So before code is even built, um, the first thing that, that you, don't, you don't want the developer to actually start typing, you know, class, and then off they go. 
maybe you want them to look at the module first. You know, what, what is the interface to this thing you're going to do, right? Maybe you want to look at that first. Uh, if you're really good, you can get a little team and you can delegate the, the coding inside to them and you take care of the interface, you know? So that's where uh, you're starting to achieve some really nice gains. Okay, so you're probably going to need a way to do this that doesn't involve text editing. So we want it to look at code. We want it to have some form of dependency model. Um, it will be hierarchical because our code is hierarchical. Um, it needs to be malleable in the sense that it's editable. It's not, this isn't about uh, producing, uh, you know, every build a picture which goes on the wall. This is about something that actually is in the, is in the, the development loop, you know, in the IDE, for example. Okay, so there's a few choices out there in terms of uh, commercial tools. Um, I'll be walking through the examples of, of our stuff with our tool, but we'll, we wanted to talk about uh, what's available for everybody just so you have a good idea what's out there. And if you agree that these concepts are important and that these tools can do it, then any, these tools will help, right? So this is why I'm just going through this. So there's Sonar Graph, which has a dependency graph, um, similar to the one that we do, although I, I think we have some advantages, but anyway. Um, Latix and IntelliJ have a dependency structure, which is a DSM. Um, so it's, it does give you an idea of, of the, the structure and who's using what. Some people really love these things and other people don't. So they're a, a choice that you may find useful. Um, if you organize them right, you can get different things. Like you can see here, there's color coding in terms of who's using, you know, uh, there is a lot of information in here geometrically set up. So that can be very useful too. Uh, and finally, there's structure on one, which I work work with and we have a concept of a levelized structure map and lately we've also put some other stuff in which um, we hope is better for developer like right down at the developer ID level right so that's that's a key aspect that we will look through tonight so there's some of the choices you have in terms of, of how we can bridge the gap with uh, tools all right so step one visualize what you have um, so why is this a good idea? So I'll just do a few bullets here on, on each of these steps about why we would do it and then I'm going to go through some examples. So the idea here that presumably it will help people to see what the system actually looks like. Um, and I think if I show you what, what uh, some of the examples are, you'll, you'll agree. And you can, you can have an opportunity at the end of this, there is a, a license available to try this tool out and get a grip on it. But usually it's fairly interesting what comes up in terms of the immediate architecture that you've got in your system. And usually there's some surprises. And I've actually been in meetings where we did this and people got into kind of little miniature fights about what, what was real and what was not. And the classic case is, you know, the team lead will go, well, it's not like that. And it's like, well, this is actually your, car, your code is parsed, right? This is the bytecode. So, sorry, but this is actually what it looks like. Um, so we definitely want to be able to see this in the context of the architecture. Now, not just the code either. Now, what, we're, what we're going to be looking at is projects, modules, POMs, and things like that. So we want it to go top to bottom in terms of the artifacts we're working with, right? And raise structural awareness. So if nothing else, if you deploy even this first step, you're going to have developers um, seeing what they're doing while they're doing it. And hopefully, if they're you know, professional, they'll try to do better when they see that something looks kind of ridiculous in terms of some of the dependencies. Um, and they may start to do things like use interfaces more appropriately or uh, limit the amount of coupling, do better containment, all those kinds of things, right? So it's, it's just kind of like a raising awareness and providing them with tools, and you end up with better hygiene and hopefully you know, better behaviors, more professional work. Okay, so now I'm going to try to convince this thing to switch for me. Oh, is that all the space I get? Okay. 
Is that, uh, oh, it's VGA, isn't it? It should be 1024 by 768. Yeah, okay. Is that 1024 by 768? Oh, well. Well, I get, we can get the general idea. Um, and obviously, even what I have on here is not good enough. I mean, using these things, you, you know, you want as, <laughs> as many monitors as you can buy. Yeah. So, uh, so what we have here is we've got, um, I'm not even going to, I'm going to have to just move around, so bear with me. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so this is IntelliJ IDEA, right? So our, our, this is our plug-in in here. What it does is it, it basically parses the bytecode while you're working, and it gives you these views, right? So this is, a, this is actually a, a web browser running D3 and a bunch of JavaScript. God help us. <laughs> so when you, you guys were talking about JavaScript, man, I feel the pain. Nah. But uh, for this purpose, it's fantastic because this D3 library is amazing for visualizations. But what this is doing is it's actually showing you the packages that are in the code. And I'll go back to the, to the top level here, right? And in, in our case, what we have is this, you know, this pile of, of various projects, not too many. There's, there's uh, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60. And we've seen people with hundreds. I don't know what you guys have in terms of projects. I mean, even at this level, there's enough going on here. It's kind of complicated. And this is level one of how many layers, right? So we really do need some way of organizing these things. Now, what we've got here is basically we are including in this in this view the very top level projects. So this icon is the same as, you know, the icon that that IntelliJ uses for for the projects. So underneath there we've got this, you know, we start into the Java structure, right? And you can see we have here this little rectangle means you have some cyclic dependencies. So again, from the point of view of this step one, what, what are you dealing with in terms of uh, your dependencies? So it's easy enough to see um, by navigating through here what the various um, layering would be, right, at each level. So as you go through this, and, and basically you can go all the way down to, to the methods, right? So what we're trying to do is get to a point where people are going to see this stuff and when they're coding they're going to know that there are actually dependencies now one thing that a lot of people will do is they'll stay they'll stay at step one and they'll say well you know what I want to do is I I just want to get rid of cyclic dependencies I agree with this layering this layering is actually correct that I want you know things in this layer that basically if I'm looking at this I want tools at the top you know, these are here, that's fine. I want logging at the bottom. I want util at the bottom, right? You don't want util being, uh, being used by everybody. Util is at the bottom, right? Your hardware abstraction layer would be at the bottom, that kind of thing. So, okay, fine, I'm happy with that. So a lot of step one people will go, that's fine. <coughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for these, um, these uh, funny dependencies that I've got here, right? So I can chase down. And I should mention that this feedback dependency here is, is what we're considering to be evil in this case because why is it evil? Well, it's calling upwards, right? So, you know, in a, in a kind of very simple moral sense, that's bad because what it means is that if you do have a proper layering and someone come in, someone uh, codes, and they don't have any of this kind of view, it's very easy to just throw that in there. And then the next one comes in, and the next one comes in, and eventually you have that picture where everybody's talking to everybody. So even if you can get to the point where you chase down these dependencies, right? Uh, and I'll go into here, and you can see, look, things are getting complicated, right? But I can see here that that, that one is, is um, going out of here. I can see that it's this guy that's one of my problems, right? So what I'm going to do is, in this picture, I can actually just kind of focus on this guy, right? So what I can do is, obviously, when you have that much stuff on the screen, it's almost hopeless to navigate it. But we have this idea of spotlighting. So now you can say the developer can actually just go right to that point. The whole, the whole, whoops. Oh, I just lost it. I have to go back to there. Oh, well, you know, I'm going to cheat. We can go uh, this way too. 
So, so the idea, now that, see that back and forth, that's, I don't know about you, I like that really cool because that means that anytime I'm in here, I can just see where I am and told the whole picture. Now I know there's a few cases where people are making changes to small pieces of code. If they saw that that code was being used by 10,000 things, they would have acted a little differently in terms of you know, their behavior. So just small things like that are, are good gains. But what I was looking at was this particular situation. So now I've got this get tool ticks test. So I navigated down to this crazy method, right? And so I'm a developer. Now what am I going to do? Well, uh, you know, my boss told me I had to get rid of all these bad dependencies. Well, the reason is because Piccolo's going out next year and you can't, we can't take it out unless these are gone, right? So in my contrived example here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down into this uh, method where I, where I see this issue. I'm going to uh, cheat a little bit and open this up a bit. And quick little question. Yep. The little icons are the open box. Are those like protected methods and then the key ones are like private? Yes. This would be all those adornments are related to whatever IntelliJ has, we do the same thing. So so yeah. So what I want to do is if I'm a if I'm a developer here and I'm really lazy and I'm not going to do any testing, not even in prod. Uh, I'll just take this out, right? So, now what we'll actually do is our system will just watch that and then it'll, it'll recompile and re show you the view again. So now it's gone, right? So that dependency is gone. Now obviously it's not going to be that easy. But the point is that the developer really, if you say to your, your guys, or it's you, you know, you can go, okay, well, this is actually pretty straightforward now. I should go through here and really dial this in. So that's the kind of a step one example of the kinds of things you would do with that. And I would, uh, I would suggest if you, if you do nothing else with any of this information is run this thing on your own project because you will probably see some interesting stuff. And you can just navigate around and, and do a few of these kinds of things. But a lot of people will stick basically with um, with that kind of step one. And and if your layering is in a position where you don't think it's too bad, um, then what we will show you is the dependencies that are still kind of evil. Now these these uh, dependencies came back as purple. That just means they're new, right? So the other aspect of this is if you're doing QA and you get a build, we will show you all the new dependencies as purple from last night's build. So this is very interesting to, to, the, to some of those guys. They're looking at it and going, well, I have no way of really visualizing what happened in terms of the code unless I review all the code. But now you can kind of get a view pretty quickly by navigating through here or even setting up some specific views that you like. Right? So that's, that's that with this kind of thing. Right? So this is a plugin that sits in the IDE and does that particular job. So in sure. this instance, uh, straight because you're, I know you're just showing examples, but I've been using Crypto for a while. Okay. Uh, so in this case, I don't know what that code does, but it looks like you've got some kind of a global cert, or some kind of a fairly high level interface that's implemented all over the place in the world. But you want to use it at a lower level. How, how would you, this is a great example, you just get rid of the code and it goes away. But how do you, how do you, Get rid of the cyclic dependencies without actually just deleting the code. What are you going to do with those global or higher level services? Well, you you push them down, right? But I, I can't push them down to four different leads. They're only going to exist in our place. Well, okay, so. In, that, that uh, work is done more in, in the Structure 101 Studio. This is a workspace IDE one. So I'm going to jump to, to right. Studio in a few minutes. So it's a prompt that I read into all over the place. And so yeah. I, I struggle with it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's... No, it's... A, yeah, it's an excellent question. So what we'll do is one, when we get into Studio, I'll revisit that a bit. So if I don't cover that explicitly, just remind me. Um, now again, there's no this is there's no magic bullet, right? I mean, this is like visualization. It's helpful, but there's still a lot of hard problems here. So we're not, yeah, you know, it, it may be that I mean, what we're hopefully doing is allow uh, giving you enough information to make good decisions. 
like I say, okay, I have a couple of strategies for, for dealing with that, right? I could push that thing down. I could just separate it out into each project, if what, maybe, and maybe that's not the right way to do it. But it all depends on the dependencies and where you think it should go. So hopefully by just seeing a little more of the, the overall gestalt, it's easier to make those decisions even. Right, the hard work is still hard work, but... Um, I think you learned our work. So. Sure. Uh, 15 years ago, I used two products, uh, which was Rational Rose and Together J. And they were actually with the reverse engineering and back and forth. You, yes, there was a, there was a certain level of, uh, of, of borderline. Everything was based on the UML. Mm -hmm. but, but conceptually, I could do exactly the same thing. So from the main difference from the kind of what's what's the main difference from that particular plugin system comparing to you know the tools which use UML as a as well a how many the, how many developers used Rational Rose every day to get rid of problems or Rational Rose would not show you when you added a link how many other people were actually using that this is a very low level specific coding kind of tool this example right. Yeah, yeah, so this is, this is... <laughs> okay, that was an example, because like, you have uh, objects for UML, you have a gazillion of other yeah. tools, which is, UML is our standard, and we just do back and forth, which is like, you know, the reverse engineering and generate from this thing. One thing I think is different here yes. is that uh, Rational, for example, could not really look at the code, the implementation code, and the dependencies of that. Yeah. That seems to be doing that. Right? Yeah, this is, this is the, this is the real part. So what, what drove me nuts about Rational Rose was you could go off and do a beautiful design. How did you know it was being done? You have no idea. You'd have to go and analyze it again. And yeah, but the reverse engineering part was it wasn't. Yeah, well, this is in the IDE. You just change the code and it showed up. So there's no, you don't have to. Like the word reverse engineering, I guess, in that sense, for us, isn't, it's too late if you have to reverse engineer it. That's kind of odd. Why don't you just forward engineer? Okay, to get the J, it was like Borland was closer to the actual to the real yeah. real stuff, right? It was like you can actually could could modify the code to do the same. Right. Again, the only see for me right now the biggest difference, like your mail was the standard. It was like a different implementation. And probably with this this piece kind of I miss that it actually goes to the implementation because yeah. for the UML you do yeah. only just a yeah. class. Like, yeah, it's like a domain design method. itself. Yeah, there, no. There's no analysis for them as far as content. Yeah, well, that's what we found too with our with our older stuff is that there's a point where that we, you want to be able to go from the bottom to the top and back again, right? Without a lot of effort, and it's it's not easy. But if the way that this works is, it's actually parsing the bytecode as you're going. In this example, so any changes you're making, the the picture is hot in that sense. So you're not using the source code, the bytecode. It's the bytecode, yeah. The bytecode, yeah. okay. So that's, that's another kind of difference. Yeah. Just doing the bytecode, can it handle another language like Kotlin or Scala? Yeah. yeah, this, we have, uh, Scala is, is coming. The thing about Scala with IntelliJ, it's another plugin. So we have to work with a plugin on a plugin, and it gets interesting. But yeah, that's in there. It works, actually, we have one for JavaScript. And boy, that's. <laughs> People don't even want to see those pictures. Eh? I mean, we shouldn't we shouldn't slam them too much. There might be somebody. Yeah. Yeah. No. And there's a lot of issues with that about just doing static analysis. So you gotta you gotta like if you're thinking of this from an engineering point of view, you gotta stop and think. Well, wait, hold on a second, right? Like, do I really know what's going on? You know. So. But anyway, so. Uh, JSP pages work with bytecode then? Uh, JSP, um, only to a certain extent that, that it's going to see anything that has class files or is in a jar in that sense. So you won't see the structure of... Yeah. yeah, but it's not, it's, it's tricky. There are cases where it'll not, you get unexpected results. No, I don't think it is. Yeah. Do you use like natural 
as long as the byte code is, is okay. byte code, byte, byte. yeah. Anything up to that point, auto-generated uh, Java, all that stuff, it'll show up. This is really the picture of your byte code. It's what, uh, it's what IntelliJ is producing, and then we parse that. So yeah, I mean, without pressing this too hard, that is the idea with this particular situation. So um, that's good. Now I just want to go back to the, to the uh, chart where, again, here, if I can. Move this back out of the way. Okay, so those are all good questions, though. So keep it uh, keep it coming. So it, after you've gone through that step and you've you've uh, got this picture, and maybe the developers are looking at them and starting to ask a lot of questions, and hopefully uh, at least you know getting a picture visually of what they're up to, where they are in the system. Um, it becomes a uh, sort of behooves us then to look at even that top level you saw in our picture there was you know 50 or 60 things on one level so as human beings that's generally not a good plan because that's just too many things in one in one layer of abstraction right usually so one of the things you want to be able to do is organize those modules into groupings of some kind right so again it's coupling and containment um, so that's that's part of this particular step you want to be able to um, Specify module dependency constraints. So this is something that that uh, we think is a very useful add-on for Eclipse and, and IntelliJ in the sense that above and beyond what the current dependencies are, you can create a, a specification which will lock in place the dependencies that you want. So for example, and this is easier to show than to talk about actually, the uh, idea would be that if you have a module X and a module Y and, uh, and you want uh, module X only to use module Y forever. So if you're, if you're doing uh, a number of things where you add other modules in and it can get more complicated, you want to keep that module structure. Now, if people are adding modules in, in IntelliJ, all you have to do is say, well, I just want to use that, I want to use that, I want to use It's just imports, right? You're just importing from all over the place. So the example I'll show you, we can actually say, listen, uh, can't do that. You've got to, you're using a certain set of modules, and um, that's going to be the structure at this level. So again, I think I'll just go to the UI to try that one. Um, and then what we want to be able to do is uh, overlay on the visualization that specified architecture, right? So the picture you just saw was the code as it was. When we put in these module dependency constraints, we want to be able to have that also on the developer's uh, desktop, right? So if they're making uh, dependency issues there, then those should show up in that, in that arena. Okay, so that's where we're going to now. Now this gets a little more abstract, so I hope we've had, we've had our beer. You can add any dependency from a module to a module, which you can't do is, is, and you can't do cycles, right? So that's one good thing, is you can't have cyclic dependencies amongst these modules. But what you can't do is you can't put a rule in place that says I only want this module to use these modules. Oh, I think you can in Java 9. In Java 9, yeah, but that's not here yet. And this will actually be a Java 9 editor when that comes out, because these modules will be Java 9 modules. So yeah, you can, you can specify that then. So like only use module A. Right. And it'll be now that, so uh, in, our, in our workshops now, we've got basically the Java 9 parser, so it comes up and shows you that stuff. So you don't have to edit those files. That's more text editing. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully that will be easy enough to edit with this also, and you won't have to worry about dealing with those, uh, those inf files, right? Those module info files. Um, so let's play with this idea a little bit. So the scheme um, here is that we want to be able to um, do something with the overall structure here. Now before we do anything else, I just want to show you how this actually works and, and how visualization here. So if I see that build tools is, is working on, how are we doing for time? I'm getting close, aren't I? I think I'll probably speed up a little bit. The idea would be that we want to be able to see these structures. Now you can see here, Build Tools is using all these other things. Now what we're actually showing here is what, I, what IntelliJ is telling us about these module dependencies, right? That's where that comes from. 
So this is a way of visualizing your module dependencies. Now, there were some people we talked to that that was enough that they would just pay for it because they, they had 300 projects in Eclipse. And it was massive. They said, if we can get it, even a picture of that, we're willing to, you know, pay. And I said, well, we have a tool for it. We don't want the tool. Just give us the picture. <laughs> so, okay. Um, what we've, what we've got here for dealing with this kind of specifying part is uh, an editor for that actually, right? So I'll bring that up. What this will allow us to do is work at this module level and put some, some rules in place about uh, the structure of that. So it's just opening on the other screen here. Okay. So that's right, and yeah, and in, in those are that's you can't do cyclic dependencies in those modules, right? So it's all one way. Yes, uh, not at this level because this level is not not a it's acyclic. But when you go further down, you saw there was a couple of those, and we looked at that case where I took just hacked the code out. Um, those those cyclic dependencies or tangles we call them or feedback. Those if your layering is in good shape, then that's your sort of step one. Just make sure you don't have any more of those, and you'll have a pretty decent life. Um, the problem is if you take something like this and put any any normal huge system into it, there's quite a lot of those. And back to the question of it. Right now you were highlighting a package. Oh yeah, the uses and use by. Yeah, yeah, it does both. All the uses. Yes. Right. Yeah. Can you highlight a package and see the use by? Well, what it'll do is it'll it'll uh, if you're high if you're spotlighting anything, it'll do both. It shows you above and below. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what we've got here now is that we've taken that that top level picture, right, and it basically puts it in this kind of a. Uh, what we call a rule structure. So this is a little different because what you're doing here is you're actually specifying relationships. And what happens with this uh, picture when you're finished with it and you publish it or when you put it back onto the IDE and share it through Git or however you want to do that, um, it will raise violations um, the same way that those other tangles were raising violations. So let me show you an example of how we would do that. Um, you can move these modules around in here, and they'll actually they'll actually change direction, right? And and you can see now that this this build tools is on the top. What that means is that if any of these underlying um, projects try to use build tools, you'll get a violation. Now, IntelliJ doesn't care if you know any one of these packages uh, brings in builds uh, brings in build tools through module settings, right? It won't it won't care. It's basically it's up to you to figure that out. What you can do by putting this structure in place is you can make sure that people don't accidentally or through um, through you know lack of knowledge or whatever start to use things that that module in your design you did not want them to use that, right? So if for example you have a situation where uh, well, let me show you how that would work in, in this way if I go down here. So build tools is now on the bottom. Now what, what is going on now is that all of these packages are being used by build tools, right? So these are actually violations. Because of where build tools is in the layering, these are violations now. Okay, so this, this gives you a kind of a way of dealing with module dependencies. So this is step two, right? Do your module dependency structure. And at least that gives you a top level of organizing that, right? So I'm going to put this back to where it was, I think. So any of these moves in here are, are reversible, thankfully. Can you specify whether packages are the same as each other? So in, in this scheme, any, any uh, class, any packages or, or anything on each of these things are are not to be using each other. They're, they're to be independent. 
Now what you can do here is also you can do a number of interesting things like if I see that I, I want to put, you know, for whatever reason, I want to put these packages or these modules inside of a new module, right, I can do that. So if I'm getting a little annoyed by the, the size of my, uh, my upper level, My upper level modules are just getting a little hairy, right? I'm going to leave that terrible name there. I can group these things. Now at this level, everything's going to still have the same uh, dependency relationships, but my rules will actually work with, with this thing, so right? Drill inside and then that right, so if I wanted to even layer this up, you know, I could say, I could do that, for example. Um, and I'm going to go kind of quickly now, so I hope I, hope I don't um, gloss over too many of these concepts. But another extremely powerful idea with this is that you can actually make these kinds of things into real modules. Uh, so a real module has an interface and it has a, has a hidden part, right? So if I decide that for whatever reason this is going to be my interface, then what I want to do with these two is make them private. So what we have is this idea of privacy. You see the little lock there. Okay, so what that says is anybody starts using these from outside of this module and you're going to get a violation. So it allows you to say even at the, even at the topmost level in your system, group things into modules, right? Real modules. And again, when Java 9 comes out and this will be part of that, then this would reflect that or be an editor in a sense for that. This, this privacy though is not This is only in the spec. In Java 9, it'll show up in your module info stuff. Yeah. Well, we're not changing code here. We're just doing the spec. So, but you know, things like that. That might be feature requests. I mean, the other thing is, it, you know, sometimes it's a light touch on the code in these kinds of situations this isn't a bad thing because developers need to have the freedom to do what they need to do. But we want to say here, you know, there's parts of this system that are just basically off limits to this part of the system, right? And layering is the, the way that you're expressing that. Okay, so what happens with this now? This is a nice picture, whatever, but I want to be able to go back to that, to the, to the ID and actually see it in the ID, right? So what I'll do is I'll save that and then I'm going to find my ID again. And what you'll see in a moment here is that this will update when the, when the refresh occurs and it'll show that model. Now what the model has done is it's gone into this, I call it the concrete brick wall effect, but it basically tells the developers and anybody who's interested that this is actually a specified world now and that uh, you know some of these modules are containers and that's fine, so there's depth to these. Um, now you notice that this, this does not have a Java 9 module on it yet because um, this is Java 8 stuff. I think IntelliJ, we're not, they're not Java 9 yet, are they? Or? Yeah, they are. They are, but they're, okay. So we were, we were having issues with the way they were doing some of their stuff, but that'll get sorted out. But the, uh, no, their, their, their platform is not Java 9, but you can do Java 9 on it. Yeah, yeah it doesn't run. Yeah, so we have to, that's where we ran into problems with them because they were like, well, we want to do this Java 9 stuff. Well, you can't yet. <laughs> Oh, anyway, it's right on the cusp, yeah. But this, I mean, that's that was just music to us because th th it's just it's so obvious that you need this at this level, right? So outside of the tool as it is now, when Java 9 comes in, this is just going to be even better and easier, right? And you'll be able to create modules at this level, and then um, you know populate them and that sort of thing. Yes, so, so when, you do a, when you do any work here, it's basically uh, saved on exit kind of thing, right? But the, um, the idea is that this is, a, this is our preference, this workspace plugin preferences page. So there's a number of ways of accessing um, the settings, which are a number of things about, about the project, and specifically this workspace spec file. This is a different beast because you might have more than one of these. 
right? So, so that's what we're working with at this point. Is yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I think, um, is it in these? Is it in this path? Yeah. See, these are all from my Git demo path. So. We share these things. Basically, if you made a change to this, like it would depend on your team organization or whatever. But if you, if you were wide open and, and your developers were, you know, at the level where they ed they're editing these things, then they can share them through Git, do whatever they want, create their own. Um, well, it's more like I'm the architect. I'm, I'm building these, these constraints. I yeah. want them to be, of course, applied in the environment that the developers That's right. So then you would, you would basically push them out into the commit them. Right, and then these people have the plugin. They load it up. They don't have to do very much. They just point to the file, and that, that may be the end of their world. So one of the other one of the other things we found with a lot of these IDE plugins and tools was, if the developers have to do a lot of stuff, it, it will not happen. So we were trying to really make it about as easy as as possible. Yeah, I mean you could almost like depending on the size of your team, just go around one day and get it done for them, you know. But, and they don't have to do anything after that. If they load it up and they open the map, there it is, right? And this is just a panel in, in IJ. Because as an architect, I really just want them to see the demos. Yeah. It's essentially for especially for junior Yeah, and that's why those links back are red and sort of moving and flashing and stuff. The stand valuation. The only way to see it is use the tool. Is there any way to, to is, is, is the tool or is there any way to make it as a part of the build? For example, I have a Madden build, like everything is build compile, boom. Even all my tests are fine, specs are not awaited, yeah. boom, build fails. Yeah, yeah. so there is there is a there is another part of this little product suite called build, which actually is kind of a really bad name, but <laughs> anyway, capital B build is like okay that's that's going to not be confusing to anybody, but the uh, the what it does is it just just like exactly as you said at, at the end of your workflow or wherever you want, but usually it's near the end. If somebody's injected any craziness in here that doesn't follow these these maps or rules, then bomb out. That's the most aggressive way, but you can do that. So if you're in Jenkins or or EC or whatever, it'll fail. Okay, most people don't go that far. But if you have certain certain kinds of violations you absolutely won't put up with, maybe that's appropriate. But certainly you could get a report of that information out. And there's different, uh, there's a web app which will actually show you um, these these kinds of pictures and the number of violations that are occurring and trends and all that sort of stuff. And that's a free thing that comes with it. But that build thing would run in your continuous integration. So, you know, we have people that will basically Every morning they come in and they get an email about has there been any violations of your, your rules overnight or whatever. You know, and then they would go traipsing off and carry the black hat around or whatever. So yeah, there's a number of different ways to do that. But that that is, I mean, the other point is, is it has to be it has to be ongoing, right? It can't just be draw a nice picture, push it to get, and then you know, go out for pints, right? It's, it's the architects one thing about this is the architect's really in the loop. So it's uh, it's good for communication, if nothing else. Okay, so I'm going to uh, see if I can drag this guy out of the way now. I will close this off for a moment. All righty, back over here, and okay, now we're going to have to go through this pretty quickly. So incrementally improve the architecture structure. So this is where we're at a point where we're doing things like dealing with monoliths. We're going to disentangle packages, so it's a little about the question, you know, with regards to uh, what are the strategies and how do I do that. And sometimes when you're doing that, you want to get into a situation where these moves are probably not going to be things I'm doing in the IDE, right? These are probably things that I want to play with and see what kind of structure I'm going to end up with without writing or messing with tons of code. The other thing is if you do do a large architectural change and you push it to code and then come in the next morning, you might have a riot on your hands. So it is uh, something where it's, it's going to be like maybe a project or maybe a, something a little more interesting about the work that's going on. But 
you can take it a piece at a time and you will get there and it is important. So once things are organized through step one, step two, then this is where we're at, right? So dealing with monoliths, so we've all worked with giant monoliths, it's nice to break them up, it's hard to break them up. So we can talk a bit about you know, how we might do that. We have this thing called percent specified. So it really amounts to if you're using that, uh, that tool where you're looking at how much of this code is actually in something that is you know, architected or has rules about behavior on it. Um, so we like to see that go up. And this dealing with these monoliths means you're breaking up large chunks into things that are modular. Okay, so I think I'm just going to go in here and we'll try uh, looking at the other part of this uh, suite of things, which is something called Structure 101 Studio. So that workspace is the tool that sits in, in Eclipse or in IntelliJ. This is something um, it's called Studio. It's a little different. What it does is it actually reads bytecode. So again, you're looking at actual code. Um, it's not, it's not um, any sort of derived thing. And what it does is it gives you a levelized structure map, which is this primary picture here. And it also allows you to do overlays like the, like the structure that we were looking at. And I'm going to walk through that quickly here now and see how that works. But one of the things here you can do is if you've got a situation, and here you can see that inside of this particular package, we've got a util, which is good. It's on the bottom, but it's calling upwards, right? So this is probably a bad scene. Now, this is similar to the uh, IDE view, but it's not in the IDE. What that means is you're not changing code when you're, when you're uh, playing around in here. What you're doing is specifying changes that would happen in code if you're happy with them. And you're also looking at um, the, the, uh, the overall code base with a number of other tools, which I won't go into in detail. But there's uh, collaboration diagrams, inheritance, hierarchies, all, those, all the other graphs right, that you could get. So those are all in this too. But what we'll look at here is why is this here? right? So the other part about this is now we have basically some, some interesting information about who's using what. How big is this particular violation? Now remember, I'm up at the top of the system. So there's going to be all kinds of detail in here about what's going on. But if I drill in, I can start to see that, hmm, without going to the bottom here, I can see that there's already some pretty interesting information here, right? So I see that there's a couple of things in this util package, which if I look at this, Server utility, okay, nice name. Why is it calling up out of here? Something's fishy, right? And uh, same goes for this guy. So you can almost guarantee that in any sort of uh, hierarchy, a lot of the packages at the bottom will get this kind of leakage where things start to call out. And, and it just, it happens all over, but you're thinking the bottom's got to be the most safest places, but no, it happens there too. So again, by visualizing this, you can see it. And if you wanted to basically in this simulator, get rid of those, then you can say, you know what? I've decided by looking at this and by looking at the actual dependencies that those were in the wrong place. Now there's two, two things that can happen when one of those dependencies goes upward, right? Either the person who caused it has a class that is literally not in the right module. And it has to call out to get its job done. But the fact is that it's not in the right package. Right? So what I did there was I basically said, I want those two things in the .NET package. Right? So by moving them there, what I did was I told this uh, modeling tool that you know, I'm going to move those two things. So as you're moving stuff around in here, you're not affecting code, but we're kind of keeping track of what's going on. So that's, that's useful if you want to do a bunch of simulation on a system and, and by keeping track of it. But also, looking at it, deciding based on what those dependencies are, whether in fact it was in the wrong place or whether someone needs to go into that class and decode that call. Like, don't do that call there. Um, you know, maybe there's something in, right in here that you should be using instead of that, right? Or maybe what we see all the time is people will go and get exceptions from all over the place. And it's like, you know, there's an exception right beside you that would have done almost the same thing, right? So 
you know, you can see those things visually in this kind of situation. Yep, this, this will go to the method. Let me uh, do that here. So. Yeah, well, that's the advantage of having this kind of a, if I go up here again, and how am I gonna? This is really weird using this. Uh, thankfully, ten twenty four by seven sixty eight is not. So yeah, if you're looking at, at even at this top level, you can see here is twenty six, and it goes down, and it basically goes down to the level of where the heck, you know, all the way down to the the evil at the very bottom. If it is evil, and eh, sorry about that tiny little screen there. But yeah, it, it covers down to the method. Now, in in the last step here, before we uh, before we wrap this up, I'm going to show another way of using these things that are very interesting. Now, one of the things that we ran into with our stuff was we wanted to um, basically make a demonolith something, but the, our case was that we want to make sure that um, what is this wrapped the actual boy oh boy that was a little weird yeah they don't even you don't even code for that anymore it's like what nobody would do that okay so what we had was a situation like um, basically you get third party stuff coming into your system right so we, we use all, all kinds of things we use it for obviously um, what you've got in this situation is you've got a fairly large piece of code here, which is this, this licensing library, which is a third party. Now, if you have a situation where, um, I'll turn on all the dependencies here, you can see that in this case we, we, have, um, we have our system up top here, and we have this, this thing at the bottom being used, right, so that's good. Um, if you wanted to actually take this out of of this location, right, and make it its own module, um, you're basically going to do this, but you're going to end up with a bunch of things that are other parts of the system are using it, right, as you can see here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make that happen because I do not want this thing to be this tightly bound into this world, right? I want, it could be these guys go out of business, they have some giant security breach, whatever. Um, for the record, they seem to be fairly good so far, so I'm not, I'm not casting any aspersions on them. But you definitely don't want something like that, that coupled to, your, uh, to the rest of your code, right? So what I'm going to do here is I'm just gonna do a little thing quickly to, to basically, in this tool, you can move stuff around just by names. So I'm going to say, let me take everything now and, and license, start out license, and put it into an interface and a licensing.nl package, right? So this, um, one amazing thing this, this can do for you is you have, if you have test code all over the place, but it actually has test in the name, you can take it and just move it away from the rest of the model. Um, or do all kinds of other ways of, of looking at your code structure. All right, so what we've done now is we've moved this out of here, but interestingly, I'm still using stuff in the core, right? So something is fishy here. Now I can, in my contrived example, we'll see what's fishy. I won't be able to necessarily fix it all in the time we have remaining, but there's an Alperian package here, so I know that that's fishy, that's gonna move down. But I notice also here that I do have some violations now going backwards up. Now these are really, these are bad because I do not want licensing to use anything in the rest of the system, right? So boom, there it is, right? Fix these up, right? So now I can take this and I can push that um, through and actually bring that up in the ID and these will show up in violations. So in a matter of minutes, I could do this work um, publish this to Git, have guys pull it, and they'll see that as, a, as something to work on. So it's a way of saying to, to developers, you know, here's some code I'd like you to not uh, be doing this call. It's not anybody's fault. We're just restructuring. But, you know, get rid of those red lines and we'll be in good shape. 
right? Now I can see the details here. These are legit. They were legit, right? They're not anymore. Um, now what you don't want to be able to do, or don't want to have to do, is, is do this beautiful picture and stick it on the wall, and then everybody doesn't necessarily pay attention to it, right? Or, or they pay attention to it at a certain level. But, you know, let's have the code to keep up to date too, right? Well, there's that too, yeah. Okay, so I think that's where I'll, uh, I'll stop. I didn't answer your question completely, but we can do that uh, after. I did have one question. What about reflection? <laughs> oh, sorry? <laughs> reflection. Ah, uh, so anything at runtime, static analysis, right? This is purely static here. There's no dynamic. It, the only relationships we see are what's in the bytecode. Yeah, so if you're pulling in like, if you're pulling in a class name and then you're messing with it and then you you know getting the methods and yeah. Is there a plan to capture information, for example, when you're using it and sending it out in the future? Well, we could be doing that kind of thing. We we kind of see that there's still there's enough value in this kind of thing that that would be kind of outside of our wheelhouse. Um, oh, it's certainly valuable. No question about it. Yeah. 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 Now there would probably be, be interesting ways to even do that with rules and things, but yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, the other thing that people say, well, what about our RPCs and things? Well, you know, you're, you know, we can see where you. Yeah. 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 All kinds of problems. Yeah, being able to visualize that better would, would be a huge thing. Yeah. I think you could do it when you drop a detail. You're using a rule, so you may not have as much control over it, but at the very least, you're going to be able to report. Yeah, it may not be as high fidelity, but you'd have some help, right? I mean, if things were really off the rails, you'd kind of see it. Yeah, that's true. Okay, I think we pushed it right to the. Right to the limit. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Okay. Uh, so for people who want to stay, they've probably set up room for us on the other side of that curtain. Um, before you go, make sure you've settled up with our server. She's, I think she's been coming around with, with bills, but uh, make sure you pay before you go. Oh, there's just one more thing. I do have a... Oh, and there's a... Uh, where is it here? Yeah, so there's me if you need me. Um, 2018.structure101.com. If you want to go there and you can get a, an EA to the to the ID plugin, uh, I encourage you to just do that. It's very simple to use. You, you install it and it analyzes and shows you pictures. Very cool. And also you can get a, a free license by emailing this dude within a day or so. He will give you a free license for uh, for that any of those tools. Your site is free for open source, right? 